Shall we wait another minute, do you think, Imogen? I think we can go because we've started we the recording now. All right. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. And uh, thanks so much for joining us. And a, a special thank you to, to Johnny for agreeing uh, to do this webinar. Um, so Johnny is, uh, works in uh, IH Cordoba and has been there for, I think, 10 years. Uh, and he's a teacher and, uh, uh, and, and an examiner. Previously, he uh, worked also at IH Dublin. And I believe that he would be the person to help me if I was looking for and trying to identify what a Dartford warbler was. <laughs> Is that right, Johnny? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I was sent sent on on a chase of one of those uh, not so long ago. Ah. I, I I couldn't see it myself. All right, so in today's session, uh, Johnny's going to tell us about how, helping our students with those sort of uh, habits, good good habits for language learning, which I think uh, all of us teachers would would love to do. So I, for one, am really looking forward to the session and have been since last November. Uh, when I first read about it. Uh, so thanks once again, and over to you, Johnny. Okay, well, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to share my, my screen with you. Um, so one moment. Okay, is everybody able to see the my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, when I was sort of looking through my, my slides for this session at the weekend, I came across this, this quote, um, actually, that I saw at the Young Learners Conference, IH Young Learners Conference in Cordoba um, last November. And uh, it's a quote from Aristotle that said, good habits formed at youth make all the difference. And I think as, as teachers, especially of young learners, we, we'd probably all agree with that. But today I'm also going to show that, you know, you can still teach old dogs new tricks. Uh, and I'm uh, an old dog and I'm going to be showing uh, um, how I have learned some new tricks um, over the last year or two. So the, the aims for this session, well, we're, we're going to look at the, the concept of atomic habits. Um, because today I, I find that my students have less and less time to dedicate to language learning. They're increasingly busy with schoolwork or work um, and they have less time to dedicate. So um, I think it's part of our job as teachers to tr try and help them make English become part of their daily routine. Um, and the other aim of this session is to look at the four laws of ha habit formation and explore ways that we can apply these to, to language learning. So the idea for this talk came about from uh, a birthday present. So um, my, my girlfriend, my partner, gave me this book, which is called Atomic Habits by James Clear. For my, for my birthday present, a, along with a set of bathroom scales. And I think it was a, a hint that maybe I, it was about time I lost a little bit of weight, started looking after myself a bit better, because I'd put on a bit of weight at the time. Um, and I did have a bad habit of eating a lot of things which were bad for me. But much to her disappointment, I read this book and I thought, oh, I could apply this to to language learning and thought about my students. Um, and, but I did, I did try to take on some of the tips for myself. So what are atomic habits? Well, there are small 1% improvements that, that compound over time. Um, and the, it's not an idea of making a, a major breakthrough. You know, if, if I decide to go to the gym, and, and get fit, I'm not gonna get fit overnight, okay? It, it's about making changes that lead to incremental growth. And this, this is 
shown from, this is a graph from the book, which uh, shows the effect of small habits and how they compound over time. So in the graph, we can see that a 1% improvement every day leads to results that are 37 times better after one year. So this is the, the power of um, incremental changes. And I also just wanted to share with you this other graph from the book, um, which again, when I looked at it, my first thought was about my, my students. So many students who take up English as a new hobby, let's say, um, they, they think that, that within a few weeks they're going to be able to speak English and be able to communicate with people. Uh, and we know as teachers that the reality is not always true. Um, and sometimes this leads to a bit of frustration on their part. And, and this graph shows this. The, the so straight line um, shows what we think will happen when we learn a language, for example. We expect steady improvement. But what actually happens is that there's a, a lag effect, it takes time, and mm, the result is that we have this valley of disappointment, okay? And uh, this is the, the gap between the reality and what we think is going to happen. Um, and I thought about maybe our, my A1 students who are learning English for the first time, they, they often think, you know, they're going to be able to speak English within a few weeks. But it takes time and there's this, they're in the valley of disappointment. They become disheartened and it's our job to help keep them motivated, keep them learning. So one of the examples of the benefits of atomic habits given in the book by James Clear is of the British cycling team. And between 1908 and 2003, the British cycling team had one Olympic gold medal and zero Tour de France wins. And they hired Brailsford, who has been in the news recently because he's now working for, for my football team, Manchester United, um, and he's trying to turn them around. And what he did when he joined the British cycling team was he put in place a strategy which he referred to as the aggregation of marginal gains. And essentially this was making small changes which would compound and lead to big, big results. So things he did included things like redesigning the bike seats, to make them more comfortable for each rider. Um, he got the riders to wear heated shorts to maintain the ideal muscle temperature while riding. He also tested a range of different massage gels to find out which one led to the fastest muscle recovery. He hired a surgeon to teach the riders how to wash their hands correctly to reduce the chances of them catching colds. And I think this one is my favorite. He painted the inside of the trucks that were used to transport the bikes. He painted them white so that they could easily detect small specks of dust that could reduce the performance of the bikes. And he also, this is quite famous, he um, tested different pillows and mat mattresses with riders to decide for them to find which one help them get the best night's sleep. And, oh, thank you, Paul. I just saw your, your message in the chat that he helped marathon runner beat the two hour limit. I, I wasn't aware of that. So, well, I'm hoping that he'll have big, uh, a big positive effect on Manchester United, my football team. But what was the effect on the, the British cycling team? Well, In 2008, at the Olympic Games, they won 60% of the gold medals in cycling. The 2012 Olympics, they set nine Olympic and seven world records. 
And between 2012 and 2017, the British riders won the Tour de France five times. And between 2017 and, or sorry, 2007 and 2017, British cyclists won 178 championships and 66 Olympic or Paralympic gold medals. So big changes, massive results. Some question whether this is all down to the, the marginal gains, but I think it certainly played its part. One of the things that James Clear talks about as well is um, the difference between goals and systems. And again, I think we can apply this to language learning. A lot of my students here in Cordoba, they, they want to get the Cambridge B1 or the B2 exam. They want to have that certificate. And that's the goal that they want to achieve. And, and they, and maybe we as teachers, tend to focus too much on the goal. But we need to change our mindset and think a bit more about the systems, the, the process that leads to the results. So in the case of language learning, this could be study habits. So he says that goals are, are good for setting directions, but systems are best for making progress. You know, so we, we should change our focus and think about the systems instead. So I, I thought as part of this, I would look at the, the habits of some of my my learners who were very successful and see if I could learn anything from them. And well, I spoke to Christina who last, or no, two years ago passed the Cambridge C2 exam. She's now working as an English teacher in, in Cordoba. And I asked her about what, what were her habits with regards to English. She said that she loves listening to music and that she did lots of shadowing. And shadowing is, she said, singing the lyrics slightly behind the singer. And she said she focused a lot on trying to imitate the sounds. Um, she made her own flashcards and vocabulary lists. She also did a lot of what she called self-talk. So she used to have conversations in her head while doing the ironing. Um, and I thought about it, I thought, oh, I do that as well. Maybe not when I'm doing the ironing, but when I'm standing at the um, meat counter in the supermarket, I, I sort of plan the conversation I'm going to have in Spanish with, with the butcher. And she also said that she chats and writes a lot to friends in other countries in, in English. She said she also had to do a lot of presentations in front of people. And this quote from her, she said, if you're too comfortable, there's no progress. And that's something we'll come back to a little bit later on. But all these things she integrated into her life in an unplanned manner. And she said that she thinks that small amounts consistently and in a way that don't feel like you're studying are the ones that make the big changes. And then I spoke to uh, one of my students who is Carlotta. She was in my class last summer and she passed the Cambridge C1 exam. And again, she read a lot in English. She said that she always looked up new vocabulary that she encountered. Again, she has a uh, an American friend that she chatted to every day in English. Again, she created her own study cards and with new vocabulary, which she used to test herself. And she actively tried to insert this into her conversations. And most amazingly, she, she has composed songs and sings in English, and she's done this since the age of eight. Now, I don't think all our students can do that, but um, she, she was very talented. 
and she provided very good halftime entertainment in our C1 intensive summer. So another thing that James Clear talks about in, in his book is identity. And well, how many of you here, you can put up your hand or, or write in the chat, how many of you have heard a student say, I'm no good at English or I'm no good at languages? Oh yeah, see, Paul, you've hands up, yeah. Lots of people saying yes in the chat, okay. And many of them, yeah. So they've created this identity for themselves that they're they're not language learners. Um, but our identity emerges out of our habits. So the more we repeat a behavior, the more you reinforce the identity associated with it. So each time you make the bed, you're an organized person. Or each time you speak in a second language, you're a linguist, okay? And we already do this, you know, we, we say, oh, I'm a creative person or I'm a sporty person, but we tend to also put negative labels on ourselves. So one of the things, one of my atomic habits, which we'll come to in a moment was going to the gym. And every time I went to the gym, I said to myself and to my partner, I'm a gym person now. And it was kind of half joking because for me, a gym person was one of those people with all the lycra and, you know, really buff looking. And I was, I'm a gym person, you know, but with time, I, I started to believe it. And I think we as teachers, we need to encourage our students to rethink who they are. So they are, they're language learners. And I also was thinking about this recently because one of my students is called Guillermo, Spanish. Well, in class, he's not Guillermo, he's William. And I'm sure a lot of you probably have students who, who like to use English names in class. And I think there's some debate over this, but certainly with him, when he comes into class, he's an English speaker with his English name, William. And I think he's certainly got his identity clear when he comes into the classroom. So, as I mentioned a moment ago, my atomic habits. Well, I wanted to be 70 kilograms. So I said to myself, I'm going to go to the gym twice a week. I'm going to eat healthier. And I wanted to be less stressed. I thought, oh, how can I do that? Well, reading helps me relax. So I'm going to read at least 10 pages of my book every night instead of scrolling through Facebook. So I'd like you to think about your target habit now, okay? It doesn't have to be language related, it can be, it doesn't have to be. And maybe in the chat, you can say, I want to, let me know what you want to do or want to be, and what you're gonna to do to achieve that. Maybe I'll, I'll read some out. I want to lose 40 kilograms, so I'm going to train four times a week. Okay. I want to get better at tennis, so I'm going to go to a class once a week. Excellent. I also want to stop scrolling at night. Yeah, I think that's a big one, isn't it, for our generation. Um, so you're gonna read. It's a great one, really. You'd be amazed by how much you can read by giving up Facebook or Instagram. Wow, I want to finish writing a book. So I'm going to work on it for 30 minutes every day instead of scrolling through Facebook. 
Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing. <laughs> well, my my results were, um, I lost ten kilograms, and I read over twenty books in a year, which I'd gone from reading maybe one or two books a year, because I never had time. I always said I don't have time to read, but I amazed myself. I did. I read over twenty books. So I just, by changing my habits, I managed to find the time. So we can ask our learners to set their target habits for, for the term, for the academic year. So it could be, for example, something about, I want to be a more confident speaker, so I'm going to study idioms or I want to improve my reading skills. So I'm going to read two pages of my graded reader every day. Okay. And I think maybe a lot of us already ask our students at the beginning of the year about their targets, no? But we probably don't talk to them enough about the process, how they're going to achieve that target. Um, the great thing about the habits is the more we repeat them, the more automatic they become. Okay. I'm I'm 40 and oh, I've got lots of terrible bad habits. Okay. Or if you think about your morning routine, no, I mean, one of my habits is checking the news on my phone every morning while I'm eating my breakfast. I've developed this habit just from doing it every day. Um so, but we can also do this with positive habits, okay? Things that are good for us. So doing them over time, they'll help become, they'll help them become automatic. So in James Clear's book, he talks about the, the four laws of behavior change. And when we create a, a good habit, we tend to, or we need to follow these four laws. So the first one is making it obvious, okay? So if you want to become a more natural speaker of English, you could install Quizlet on your phone, okay? Everybody has their phone with them. So it's always there, it's obvious, it's easy. Okay? Um, the second law is that we need to make it attractive. And one of the ways we can do that is by using something called temptation bundling. So uh, you reward yourself. So for example, I have study five phrases on Quizlet and then I can check my Facebook. Okay. Make it easy. Well, I said, you know, we've all got our phones with us. So that's easy. We can study at the bus stop. We can study uh, our Quizlet set while um, while waiting to meet a friend. And then we can make it satisfying. And again, if we take the Quizlet example, uh, Quizlet allows you to track your progress. Okay. So I, I just realized that I've been talking about Quizlet, but maybe some of you don't know what it is. So Quizlet is essentially an online flashcard. Okay. And you can create your own. I highly recommend checking it out if you if you don't know it. So let's have a look at these four rules in a bit more depth. So the first rule was making it obvious. Okay? And we have to make the cue that causes the desired habit um, attractive. Okay. And one of the ways I did that when I was learning Italian some years ago was I stuck post-it notes all around my house like this. This is not my photo, but very similar. And I learned the word for mirror in Italian while I was brushing my teeth. I was looking at the mirror. I learned the word for mm, the, the sink while washing the dishes. So it was 
the language was surrounding me every day. Now, if I show you these two, two images, and then I think you'll all agree that the line on the left is the same length as line B in the middle. Yeah, everyone agrees there. Okay, fantastic. Well, what if the, I've actually done a played a trick on you? Okay, because nobody nobody spoke up and said no. Because you were probably all thinking Johnny's gone a bit crazy. It's line C is the same length. Yeah, and uh, this is maybe some of you have already seen this, but this is part of a an experiment called Ashes Conformim. Uh, conformity, conformity experiment, yeah, um, where a psychologist developed this experiment and he, he got nine actors and he told them all to say that line B was the same length as this example line. Okay. And he got another person who was not in on the trick and they listened to the responses of the actors. All the actors were saying, yes, line B is the same length. And this other person thought, oh, OK, I'll just go along with the crowd and say, yes, line B is the same length. And that's what the majority of people do. They conform. They want to fit in. OK, in this experiment, very few people put up their hand or said, no, it's actually line C. You're all crazy. You're all wrong. And this kind of human need or human desire to fit in, to feel accepted, we, again, can use to our advantage when it comes to language learning. So we, we need to join a culture where the desired behavior is the norm. So in my case, that was going to the gym. Okay, I couldn't go to the gym and eat biscuits. <laughs> I had to go and do my weights or run on the treadmill like everyone else. But with language learning, that could be joining a conversation class or a Facebook group in, that's in the desired language. So I think as Shanna alluded to at the beginning, I'm a bit of a, a bird freak, bird watching freak. And I'm in many bird watching groups in Spanish. And I, I have to write in Spanish. It forces me to. Or could be like lots of my, my students. They love online gaming. And they use English as a common language there. So they're, they're conforming, fitting in. Okay, I see a few people in the chat saying, yes, it, it was line C. You were very brave. Well done. So a thing that we can do is we can stack, or uh, as James Clear refers to it as piggyback, a new habit on top of an existing habit. And this way, you're more likely to remember to do it, and it will more likely become part of your routine. So you can say to yourself, after my current habit, I will do the new habit. Okay. After I finish my lunch, I will study 10 new words. Or every time I walk to school, I listen to an English podcast. Okay. And this, this works even better if we have a set place and a set time to do that. Okay. If we think about the time and the place when we're creating this implementation intention okay and I did this with my first certificate teenagers and I got them when I set them a writing homework I got them to write when they were going to do it the time the day and where and amazingly they all came back with their homework done so you can do that with your your students So 
The second rule was to make it attractive. What are we trying to do? What's the habit we want? Make that attractive. Okay, humans, we we like things which are attractive. You know? I like biscuits because they're full of sugar. They make me feel good. Okay, um, but how can we use this to our advantage? Well, um, the the more attractive it is, the more likely it is to become a habit. Um, so we can use what's called temptation bundling. That's a habit that you want to do, for example, uh, could be watching Netflix and an action that you need to do, exercise. And this was exactly what an Irishman called uh, Ronan Bryan did. And he connected his laptop uh, to his cycling machine. And he wrote a program that paused the Netflix show that he was watching if his speed dropped too low. Okay, so he was forced to cycle really hard to be able to watch his, his Netflix series. So I think it's a, a genius idea, no? Um, so we can do the same, no? That, I'll pull out my phone and I'll do 10 sit-ups. That's what I need to do. And after I do the 10 sit-ups, I'll check Facebook. And that's what I want to do. So again, maybe I'll ask you to tell me in the chat what temptation bundle you could do. So you said, some of you said before that you want to stop scrolling on your phone or you want to dedicate 30 minutes to writing your book. Well, think about a temptation bundle you could do to make it more attractive and maybe post it in the chat. When I finish marking five writings, I'll eat some chocolate. I love it, Christina. <laughs> so, Christina, I think you, you told me there at the beginning that you'd read the book. I think, um, I think if I remember, James Clear said that we have to be quite careful with this, that we don't develop new bad habits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> Chocolate's always a winner, yeah. <laughs> After I finish my Italian studies, I will have dinner out with my friends. Nice. After I complete uh, writing an activity, then I can read the news, yeah. I'll have another coffee after I mark uh, five assignments, okay. <laughs> oh, I want to spend less time sitting down, so I will use my desk, standing desk, for 30 minutes a day, and I will treat myself with a tea break afterwards. Very good. Okay, excellent. So we can get our students to do the same. In class, get our students to think about what habit they want to develop and let them come up with a reward. Okay. Um, and if you do this, I think it's always nice to, to revisit it the next class. Oh, did you... Um, did you do your 
habit? Did you uh, revise your vocabulary, etc.? Okay, so it's it's nice to follow up with them. So the the third rule, behavior change, is to make it easy. And human behavior follows the law of least effort. I think we'd all probably agree with that. Um, so we, we need to create an environment which removes the obstacles to doing the desired habit. Okay. So um, for example, if you want to learn to play the guitar, well, having the guitar right next to or sitting right in the living room means it's easy to pick it up and start playing. But if it's stored onto your bed, well, it's more of an effort to go and get it, dig it out, take it out the case. Okay. Um, the, the habit may not be easy, but the route to starting it should be. Okay. So um, one of the things that James Clear talks about is the, the two minute rule. I'm sure some of you will have heard about that. So it's that when you start a new habit, it should take less than two minutes to do. Um, and so essentially, you know, sometimes we have big ideas and big dreams. I want to get fit, go to the gym. Well, there's, there was no point me going to the gym my first day and doing a three hour workout. I had to start small build it up step by step, okay? Um, and, and starting is always the hard part as well. Um, I think, again, we're all familiar with that feeling when you've got some task looming over you and you procrastinate, put it off. Um, but actually, once you get down to it, and you start it, it's often not as bad as we, we thought it was going to be. So if we say to ourselves, Okay, I'm just going to do two minutes. Well, very often we find that we then just carry on because it's it's not so bad. Okay. Um, so with our students, again, it could be asking them to, to learn one phrase or to read in English for two minutes. Okay, with my young learners this year, I've got a group of, sort of nine, ten year olds and at the start of class once a week, we, we read our, our books in English and we do that for five minutes. Okay? And it's got them very used to, to reading. They started only with five minutes and then they carry on reading at home now because they enjoy it so much. Okay, And James Clear talks about that the idea with habit formation is that it's not... Um, how much or how long you do it, it's how many times you do it, okay? So he actually says that, he uses the example of going to the gym, that it's better just to go to the gym for two minutes and then leave than not to go at all, because you need to develop that habit of going two or three times a week. One push-up is better than not exercising at all. Okay. Um, and I think he called that the, the art of showing up. Okay. So going to the gym, even if it's for two minutes, he says, it's mastering the art of showing up. Um, another technique that we, we can use is the Pomodoro technique. Um, does anybody know about the Pomodoro technique? I see lots of people nodding. Um, so Pomodoro is... Italian for tomato, and it was an Italian man who, he had a kitchen timer that was shaped like a tomato, um, and he developed this idea, nothing um, very earth shattering, but um, that you work, say, for 20 minutes, and then have five minutes off, work for 20 minutes, five minutes off. and. I think this is quite good to tell our students to use. There's a, a website. If you search for Pomodoro technique, you can find a website. Um, and you can adjust the, the work time 
and also the break time. So you can start off small. You can say five minutes of work, two minutes off, and build it up. Okay. And I think it's very, very good for helping students um, build up that, that ability to, to work for longer stretches of time, maintain their concentration. Ah, your favorite way of marking, Shanna, yeah? <laughs> yes, I, I also use it for marking. <laughs> I'm just having a look in the, the, the chat, yeah. My, Christina says, my Pilates teacher says the big effort is done just by going to class. Yeah, I think that is. It, the hardest part is often just getting yourself up in the morning, and putting on the clothes and getting to the gym, isn't it? And then once you're there, it's not too bad. Okay, so I think we need to think about that when it comes to our students. Um, so how can we make it easy in terms of language learning? Well, recording new vocabulary in a way that's easy to review. So this can be easy for us to review in class by creating word cards, or it can be easy for our students to review. So again, they can create their own word card set using mind maps, Quizlet again, if they, they like digital flashcards. Um, and also getting our students to think more clearly about their notebooks. Um, and how they organize their notes. I mean, I think if any of you have teens and you ever look at their notebooks, you'll probably be appalled, no? So if at the beginning of the year, we help them implement uh, an organized notebook, again, depending on the level, for example, my first certificate teens have their notebooks divided up into different sections. So they have language for the speaking exam. Uh, they have phrasal verbs, collocation section. And it makes it so much easier for them when it comes to revising because they're not sort of sifting through a messy notebook. So it's clear for them. Um, somebody, Georgina says that they can make it even easier for themselves and look for games on Bamboozle. Yeah. Bamboozle is another great website. Having language for pair work or classroom language visible in the classroom, again, just makes it easy for our students to use it because they don't have to look through their book to try and find those phrases that we've taught them. It's on the wall. They develop the habit. I'm sure so many of you who have the classroom language will have noticed this, that students do, they, um, they kind of go, oh, uh, how do you say mm, in English? And they're reading the poster that you put on the wall. Or, uh, can I go to the toilet, please? Okay. And my students do that all the time. But with time, they don't have to look anymore. So we, we've they've developed the habit of looking, and then with time, we can take that away the the aid. And then the other thing is the the Amazon approach. And I'm sure all of us buy things on Amazon, and probably you're familiar with this concept of the one click purchase. So yeah, online shoppers nodding. So that you find something and with one click, it's yours, you've bought it. And very dangerous, but really, really easy, isn't it? So how can we apply this to our language learners? How can we make things easy for them? Well, in the school where I work, we have an online platform. Um, where we post, for example, videos. If I embed the video, rather than just putting a link, students are much more likely to, to watch the video because it's embedded. 
or if I do put a link, make sure that it's a clickable link. Okay, it seems really small, but again, have the mere fact of copying and pasting a link makes it more difficult. Um, with QR codes is another really, really easy way. So um, if you've got a Quizlet set that you want your students to, to revise for homework, create a QR code, give that to them, rather than putting a link in the online platform because then they have to remember their password, log in, go to the page, find the link. If they have a QR code that you've given to them, their mobile phone, they're there in seconds, okay? And I think, again, a lot of the new, if any of you use the, the Cambridge practice test books, they all have these QR codes for the listenings now. And it makes it so much easier for the students to do listening as a homework because they've got the QR code. And so again, we're, we're taking away these steps that make things difficult. So um, thing that James Clear talks about is the, the Goldilocks rule. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with the sort of fairy tale of Goldilocks um, and the three bears, but um, Goldilocks sort of tested different chairs and the porridge of in the three bears' house. And you know, one chair was too hard, the other chair was too soft, and one was just right. And one porridge was too hot, the other was too cold, and the other one was just right. And when we when we develop uh, a new habit, it's important that we follow this concept of the Goldilocks rule, because we experience our peak motivation when we're working on things that are just right on the edge of our limit, our current abilities. You no, know? and um, this graph shows it quite clearly. So if it's too easy, we'll lose motivation because we're bored. If it's too difficult, again, motivation drops because it's too difficult. And Krasen's input hypothesis um, states that learners progress in their knowledge of the language when they comprehend language input that is slightly more advanced than their current level. And I, I put here that Duolingo does this well. I don't use Duolingo. Maybe some of you here do. But my, my mother, who's 75, she's learning Spanish with Duolingo. And it's constantly just pushing her. And, and so she's kind of keen to go on and, and do the next level. Okay? It's not too difficult because she would just give up. It's not too easy because then... Uh, she would get bored. The last rule of behavior change is to make it satisfying. Okay. And satisfaction can be achieved or when we feel like we have achieved something. Okay. And, um, we can use habit trackers to monitor this. So again, with our students, I did it with my, my teenage students. I got them to, to create a habit tracker, a bit like in this image, it's a bit small, but they had to put what habits they wanted to start. And each time, each day that they did it, they had to mark it. And then in class, each class, we talked about it in a communicative way. They compared their trackers. They talked about why they didn't maybe achieve it some days. And you can use online trackers such as Toggle. I'm not sure if anybody has used that before. Um, and, and tracking progress is also a really good way to highlight your achievements. Okay, so 
showing your students their improvement could be in their test scores over the year really helps them feel like they're they're improving and that gives them a great sense of satisfaction and well one of the sort of competitors of international house here in spain is kids and us and um they're they're a language school that are aimed mainly at younger children and they use habit trackers so they set their children they have to do uh, listening at home every day and then they have to record ten en cuenta que yo hay 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 secciones enteras del del informe que <laughs> sorry um so they they ask the students to mark which days they have listened to the audio at home and then in class they look at it together okay so that they're encouraging their students to track their habits in my class I, I have used it for things like my first certificate class. They have the different types of writing. And simply each time they do a writing, they put a tick on the this table on the wall. Um, and it helps them to track what they've been doing. It also is quite good because um, they want to conform. They don't want to be the only one that hasn't done the, the story that week, okay? And um, I also use it with my young learners. I talked before about how we use graded readers. And my, my students now keep a track in their notebook of how many books they've read this course. And they're, they're, they've read so many that I've actually run out of books to give them, which is great. Um, so, one final point uh, is that it's important to reflect, you know, and um, James Clear says, improvement's not just about learning habits, but also fine tuning them. And having time to reflect allows you to remain conscious of your performance over time. And I think as, as teachers, we reflect in our classes after a lesson. Well, we should, Encourage our students to do the same about their language learning and um, with periodic reflection. So we can ask them about what went well this term, what didn't go so well, maybe why not? Why have you not um, been able to achieve um, your goal? What's the problem with your habit? Is there something that you need to do? Do you need to change the time that you're trying to um, study your vocabulary? and get them to think about what they've learned as well over the year. So th this, um, this last or penultimate slide was something that I found in the appendix of, of the book. And it said that being curious is more important than being smart. Okay? Um, and I, I love this, I completely agree with this idea because my students who are uh, curious are the ones that are motivated because the motivation leads to the action, okay? And they're the ones that, mm, because they, they're curious to learn new things, they go out and they, they read or they study because they, they want to improve. And, it gives a quote again from the book, which is the trick to doing anything is first cultivating a desire for it. And I think our job as teachers is to help develop the curiosity and the desire to learn. So we have, I think, about five minutes left. Um, I don't know if there are any questions or just having a look in the chat. Yeah, I, I don't think there were any more questions in the chat, but there may, if anyone wants to, you can also just put your camera on and speak and ask the question if you have any.
I think that this is a session that we should uh, watch or attend like every year <laughs> because it helps you think um, and consider what you are doing or how you can help your students. So it's a must do every year, <laughs> maybe at the beginning mm -hmm. of the course. <laughs> A great, a great suggestion, Christina. Uh, there, is, there is a question there, uh, Johnny. What are examples of positive rewards for target habits? I think I, I said that we can let our students think of their their own rewards. I think that makes it more meaningful for them, um, rather than. Like, I'm not a big believer of things like stickers or or rewards with young learners in class. Um, because I think that always leads to, um, you know, you're you're praising the the students who maybe perform better. Um, so I would let them come up with their own rewards. I think teenagers will have lots of uh, rewards. So it could be things like, you know, okay, I'll look at my TikTok for five minutes or uh, my Instagram. Um, or I think some people came up with things like, you know, chocolate. You want a piece of dark chocolate so you're not getting fat like me. Um, that's not bad. And I have a question for, uh, has anyone read the book? Christina, you said you had read it. Has anyone else read it? Just out of curiosity. I think Anne, Anna says that she rereads the book also every year. <laughs> okay. So I, I, in general, I'm not a fan of um self-help books this is a self-help book um and i'm i'm generally not into that type of thing as i said at the beginning it was a present but definitely things that quite changing your mentality um paul did you have a question if i can yeah yeah um this is it's very interesting i think it's very useful for learner autonomy as well isn't it encouraging learner autonomy it's certainly moving towards um on the climb towards uh, coaching, uh, so solution-based coaching techniques. How far might you think that that's actually useful to include more on pre-service teacher training courses so that students, uh, uh, trainees and, and therefore teachers eventually are more aware of that? Yeah, which is, I think, something, <laughs> a great idea, I think, um, I feel that as teachers, we, we need to spend more time teaching our students things like study skills, no? And that's mm. something that as when we do our teaching training, we're not really taught. Um, so I, I would love to see more of that yeah, in teacher training. Cool. Thank you. If I can make a suggestion, right, I, I can already see a poster, you know, created by International House, you know, all this stuff that we put on the walls, uh, you know, like irregular verbs and different stuff like this. But why not make a poster, as Imogen, I'm talking to you now. Why not make it, make posters like with these little tips, how you can uh, change your habits, learning habits, and just put them around in the classroom. It would be mm -hmm. fantastic for our students, absolutely. It's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Johnny, there was a question from Marina about very young learners. Ooh, uh, yeah. Let me in the chat, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Can you advise something in order to develop their langu language habits for very young learners? Mm. Um, so, a good question. Very young learners. <laughs> um, I suppose, I mean, very young learners in a way are the easiest ones, aren't they? Because they're, they're, they're the ones that are still, they haven't picked up the bad habits yet. <laughs> and they're, they're still laying the foundations of their habits. Um, so, but you might need a bit of cooperation with parents. So, I mean, I, a lot of parents I talk to here say, oh, we, we put the, the TV on in English and they watch Peppa Pig in English. And that, that's a really nice, um, a nice way to kind of build English into their everyday lives, I think. And, and the kids don't know that Peppa Pig can also speak Spanish. 
it's only when they're a bit older that they they realize there's a button on the TV that does that. But um, yeah, I, I've, I suppose it, it's tricky um, because you probably need, as I said, support from the parents. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else has got any ideas on that one. <laughs> Well, the, those sort of fun fun activities that you do in class also can be sort of a reward, I suppose, for, you know, learn something, do something fun kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Um, and again, songs as well. Like, so I talked about, we in my academy, we use um, an online platform. So we try to post all the songs that they listen to in class on the platform so that they can listen to them again at home or um, in the car. Lots of parents again tell me that. And, and I see it massively. The students that mm, are listening to the songs at home um, know them much better and have nicer pronunciation than the ones that often don't. So, um, but, and again, that's about making it easy, you know, um, could it be embedding the videos for me is a big thing because it just it's there, it's visible, the parents click on it rather than a link to some other website. Ask you a question. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really love the idea of habit trackers. And do you have any idea on how to uh, use the habit trackers effectively, especially for the teenagers, because I really like the idea of like the, the table that you had shown about the students writing a letter or story or that thing. So do they do it like outside? The How do you make sure that they are actually doing the task? Any way of us like monitoring or stuff? So you broke up a little bit there, but yeah. I think I got the gist of the question. Um, so I think two, two kind of things with my teenagers is that if when we make the habit tracker, well, three, sorry, three things. First, to make it realistic, there's no point saying, you know, oh, I'm going to study three hours every day. So get them to make it realistic. Second thing would be to, to check in every class could be the beginning of the class and get them to to talk about it. Um, and I, the third thing is to get yourself involved. So I share my habit tracking experience. It's not start learning English. It's going to the gym and eating healthily and reading books. And I share and I'm honest as well. Like I, I said, oh, didn't go to the gym today, guys. I woke up feeling really groggy and tired. And, and so I think it's just become, again, part of our routine that we check the habit uh, trackers. Um, and therefore, they're, they're more inclined, I think, as well, because we're talking about it in class. They're more inclined to do the habit because they don't want to be the one that hasn't done it that week. Peer pressure. Thank you. Um, Mohammed says, what could be a, a good cue trigger to establish good study habits? Um, I think one thing could be having like a designated area in your house. where So if it's studying English, let's say, that you, you have everything set up with your notebook um, already there. So that, you know, it could be um at the the kitchen table okay so when you come down in the morning you have your breakfast you see your english book sitting out you um it, it's visible and that's the kind of cue i suppose yeah paul you make a good point it's about accountability yeah that's exactly it um with the habit trackers it's coming from them yeah and i think that's important that we're not dictating to them uh, what the habit should be, especially teenagers, because they they know what they're good at, they know what they're weak at. Um, 
On that point with teenagers, I remember spending a almost a whole class on asking them to divide their day and 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 week and pla and and just kind of you know break it down. How long do you take for breakfast? You know, how long do you take to to do your hair in the morning before going to school? And you know, literally minute by minute, the whole week. But and then slot in the bits where they said, well, okay, where can I have my free time? That was priority number one. So, right, me time. I need my, you know, sort of brain breaks and stuff. Okay. And therefore, now we can see the other the other moments that you have free or available. And what we're doing is asking them to prioritize. <clears throat> and therefore, you can say, ah, as you said, Jonathan, you know, I do have 15 or 20 minutes every day that I could dedicate to X, Y, or Z. Ah, I didn't realize I had. But look, I can see that it's available now. I have no excuse. <laughs> so yeah. I can do it. Or or that they just tweak existing habits. So <laughs> um, if it's like, if they're watching stuff on Instagram in Spanish, in in our case, Paul, that they, they change it to English. And, and again, there's some giving them as well, the um, showing them maybe in class some um, Instagrammers or YouTubers that are in English, because uh, there are a lot out there. Um, um, I think then they go, oh, that's quite interesting, or it's quite fun. So tweaking uh, existing habits. OK. <laughs> well, thank you very right. much. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, sort of uh, there have already been a lot of sort of thank yous uh, in the in the chat, but just to say, uh, so many.